In this episode of the Stamina Lab podcast, I spoke to Dr. Shabnam Daskar. Dr. Daskar specializes in functional and metabolic medicine, is a brain health coach, advises health tech startups, and is a fellow Tiny Habits certified coach. Most of all, she enjoys talking about sleep, and that's what we do in this episode, where we break down how sleep works and the many benefits of keeping your circadian clock in alignment. We talk practically about how to manage your circadian rhythm to improve sleep, brain health, and many of the body's necessary functions. I was particularly interested in our discussion on how we manage social jet lag. With our always now instant feedback data streaming 24-7 world, it's something we all experience nearly every day. I know you get a lot out of this conversation, so let's get started. Hi, welcome to the show, Dr. Shabnam. Hi, my pleasure, Glenn. So I really wanted to start with talking about circadian health and and this our circadian rhythm is why is this so important for our over our brain health and our overall well-being that's a very interesting question it's uh, just a few years ago actually and when we say, when i say a few years ago in medicine even 10 or 12 years ago is a few uh they uh, re- researchers came up with some very interesting studies where they found that we have a master clock in the brain which takes cues from our environment. So the main cue to the environment, uh, to the master clock is light falling on our eyes. And this master clock controls everything in our body. So whether we are looking at metabolism, we are looking at the immune system, we are looking at mood regulation. And interestingly, every organ in the body has a clock. So the liver has a clock, the heart has a clock, and every cell, even cells on a, in a Petri dish, like they are not even in the body, they have this. So this clock is, of course, it's not a clock clock. It's a Metaphor. genetic mechanism. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so that is basically a biological clock and which is the circadian meaning 24. So this goes by the, you know, the Earth's rotation for 24 hours. And the thing is, we have sort of, you know, with our artificial light and everything, we've kind of moved away from that, you know, the natural life that our hunter-gatherer ancestors had where they woke up with the sun and they went back to bed or at least they sat in front of a fire at the end of the year, you know, when the sun set. But now we have artificial lights at all times of the day and night. And some of us work in many different, you know, time zones, thanks to technology. So we have sort of socially disrupted our clock. And we have, I mean, a lot of new studies have uh, told us about the importance of managing that circadian rhythm well. Because otherwise it can result in a whole lot of conditions like diabetes and diabetes is a high risk for heart disease, dementia, stroke, mood disorders. I mean, you name it, I know everything yeah. is related to the metabolism. Yeah. And then the, <laughs> the cells that we have are still those hunter gatherer cells, yeah. even though we're in thousands of years later into a modern world. Yeah. So that's why we have to still pay attention to this. Yeah, the life that we had thousands of years ago because it's still relevant. Yeah, and the other thing is actually not so much maybe that, you know, I, I don't agree completely that our bodies don't have the capacity to adapt, but yeah. I think we are changing way more rapidly than we ever did before. Like if I think back to, I grew up in India, I studied medicine in India, practiced medicine in India. Our life was very different. We used to walk to places. We didn't stay up late at night because we there wasn't much to do, you know. So it's just that the the rate of change has become so dramatic that um, you know it's that's why I think our body is trying to catch up with that. Now, when we talk about light exposure, which is uh, so important, the the impact of having light at the so much light at the end of the day, like even if it's not, even if it's not. Um, intended you know just from art like the street lights the, the yeah. ambient lights outside we hard to get it's hard to get to a dark yeah dark, or quiet place much anymore uh, this this light impacts us how so again basically the body's biological clock gets dis- disrupted because it was not used to this artificial light exposure now we have these lighted screens whether it's a tv or a laptop or a phone and that light, again, studies have shown that you know, backlit devices, if you're reading on them late in the evening, they can disrupt sleep. And 
once sleep is disrupted, a whole lot of other, you know, cascade, a lot of things cascade down that. So mood gets affected, blood glucose levels get affected, blood pressure gets affected. And all those things are related to our brain health and mood and everything else and our ability to manage our, you know, our goals, our impulse control. Everything is, you know, everything is related to everything else. <laughs> but, but really, it, it, because it is all related to everything else, to be able to impact, have like, I look, try to look at like key levers that you can have, mm-hmm. these, these habits or behaviors that you can do that has... Uh, a, a massive impact on everything, a keystone habit, uh, yeah. if you will. And, and, we, and we were both tiny habits, uh, yeah. co- my coaches. So we, we, we have some of that tiny habits language in there. And when I, I try to look at for those, those areas where you can have that main big leverage, that keystone habit, and by managing your circadian rhythm, that feels like it is a really big keystone lever. To be able to yeah. Impact yeah. So the thing is, you know, everyone, people have to look at their day. You know, uh, is it that they are working in multiple time zones because that's the nature of their job, or is it that they decide that sleep is not a priority and they need they can keep up late into the night and finish up everything they want to do? So first of all, is it possible for anyone? I mean, when I say you, I mean anyone in the audience, is it possible for you to make sure that you go to bed and wake up at the same time every day, regardless of weekdays or weekends? Because the bot- weekends and weekdays are like artificial differentiation. Our bodies right. do not know that. That is number one. So is it possible for you to do that if you're not working in multiple time zones? Then that is important. And if you are someone who works in multiple time zones, maybe your you know coworkers work at one a.m. and you have to join a meeting at that time, then what are the other things you can do? So the circadian rhythm gets impacted by what are called zeitgebers. So these are basically cues. So light falling on the eyes is one of the primary cues. The next is food, food intake. What time am I eating something? And that time of food intake. So that's the reason eating very late at night impairs our sleep because at least three to four hours time should ideally be there between the time we eat our last food or drink, not water, but things like alcohol and caffeine and stuff like that. Caffeine, of course, you ideally you need to finish drinking caffeine if it's coffee much earlier in the day because caffeine has a much longer half-life. So, uh, Food is another big cue to the circadian rhythm, and that cue actually works on the pancreas and the liver, and the pancreas has to secrete insulin, which manages your blood glucose levels. So going back to how to solve this problem, because as tiny habits coaches, we're always looking at what can we impact the most. So if you have the option of going to bed and waking up at the same time every day, of course, that's the best. Yeah. And if you don't have the option, then are you someone who's eating late at night because you get the munchies or is it that, you know, you're hungry? So if you're hungry and you end up eating late at night because you're staying up for for a meeting, then you need to go upstream and see what are you eating at the last meal? Have you got enough protein? Have you got enough fat at that last meal? Because protein and fat are more satiating than carbohydrates. But most of the time when people are eating late at night, and again, there are lots of studies which have shown that they are not eating or drinking, you know, healthy food. Or I would say things that they really wanted to eat, it's stuff like chips or something processed or ice cream. or So then, Glenn, it goes back to our tiny habits method of if that is a challenge for you, how can you change that? Can you change the environment and not have that stuff at home? (laughs) Right. Or even reduce yeah. I mean, it's there is no one right way. And it's like back in the days before I, I studied a lot of this stuff and before I got trained as a tiny habits coach, I tell patients, oh, you can't stay awake so late at night. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the fellow's job. What is he going to do about it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it should, it's like all there's so much you that you should do. There's so much advice that yeah, yeah. you should do this, you should do this, you do this. And it's almost becomes to the point where it's an overwhelm. Yeah. And you say, I just I just can't I just don't even want to do any think anything about it because it's just too much. Yeah. And so finding something that you can do yeah. that will help you with your circadian rhythm is 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 better than nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And so, another 
another uh, important thing is you know you mentioned about uh, artificial light all over so simple tricks like you know using a sleep mask because some yeah. i'm in alberta summers here are like 15 hours of daylight and however much your your curtains are like dark and then this and that still some bit of light does enter so i found and i realized that fairly late i thought why didn't i think of this simple trick earlier like yeah. particularly while traveling you can't always control you know the light in so just having a sleep mask i think that makes a huge difference to sleep quality and of course a properly fitting one not one of those airlines ones that kind of slide right. away <laughs> Yeah, and so that so you ch- try to uh, create your environment to yeah. mimic your circadian mimic, uh, yeah. rhythm uh, that darkness. you need. Yeah, the darkness, uh, which is really useful if you're traveling across time zones yeah. to be able to, yeah. even oh, if it's absolutely. it's if it's supposed to be um, it's dark outside, but you need to be on the right time zone, keeping yeah. the light on, using the light as a uh, on as well as like trying to yeah. dark. Yeah. Then there are some of these apps. I'm sure you've heard of them. There's one called F. Dot Lux. You yep. can add it to your laptop so that you know you can decide what time it should dim it down. So that because you know it's very easy to say you shouldn't be on your laptop late at night, but then you can't help it if you have a deadline the next day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? You you know your strategies have to work to your life, not the other way around. <laughs> right. Right. And yeah. I and I use um I use um. I use blue light glasses for, for mm-hmm. myself at, at yeah. night. I've I, I have some that you, that look fair, mine look fairly fashionable. <laughs> are, not the yellow uh, ones. Some, some someone can really be, look not not great, and so yeah. you, you know, if it doesn't work, you know, if it doesn't look, work in your environment, then it it doesn't work. You know, so no, it doesn't, it doesn't work exactly. Yeah. I have never tried those yellow ones. <laughs> I don't like them. Mine, mine have a slight tint of a uh, uh, blue on there. Okay. Um, and do you and find I, the help? I'll jump in. The, I'll drop in the show notes. I can't remember the brand right off the top of my head. I'll okay. drop in the show notes. My the brand that I I use. Um, but you you just mentioned these Zeit burgers, right? Zeit yeah. Burgers, yeah. And you said uh, light and food are both um, factors. What what does Zeit burgers mean exactly? So Zeit burgers basically mean they're cues to the circadian clock. So what is it that starts the clock or interrupts it or you know? Uh, the how the cycle is controlled so uh, light and food are two then exercise so okay. i'm sure you've noticed glen uh, i know you're a marathoner that sometimes for some people when they exercise late in the evening they can't get good night sleep and one of the factors is your core body temperature goes up at night if you exercise late in the evening but every time i talk about it someone in the audience will say i can exercise at 8 pm and go to bed right away so it's not the same thing for everyone you know figure right. out and what works for you rather than you know. you know yeah that's important to know that we 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 have to experiment because we all are a little yeah. bit different it's all self experiment i mean uh, you know that in the tiny habits world we say there is no right or wrong like you figure it out it's not working for you change it to do something else And right. another important thing is not to start with the most difficult habit. Now, if you are a shift worker, then I would suggest that don't start with trying to change your sleep time. Right. Start somewhere else. Start at maybe with food or you know movement, daily movement. Are you getting enough movement, or do you spend a lot of time sitting continuously? Because sitting continuously is like worse than smoking. Now. Right. And all of us have work which is like that. Like my son calls me a laptop doctor. <laughs> you know, I'm doing online consults, which is he's not wrong. <laughs> yeah, he's not wrong. I mean, how much how much of time we spend on you know in front of screens, and quite often we spend that time sitting. So I got rid of my office chair a while ago. So changing the environment so that I'm not even tempted to yeah. sit. And of course, I got a sit stand desk so that I'm not standing all the time. There are times I I need to sit. so interrupting continuous sitting i think is one of the most important strategies which anyone can implement i mean if it's like i tell i tell my patients in india i said just get a box because nowadays people don't always have books at home you know and glen are like your shelf and mine yeah. <laughs> so i said just get a box just get something and put it on your table if you don't want to buy a stand you know these are simple things to deal with you know 
and not get in the way of your metabolism. <laughs> so, so for Zeitgerber, exercise or movement is actually a, a, a Zeitgerber. And I, I'm a, I'm, I've done half marathons. I haven't done marathons because I don't, I don't want to, um, I haven't done one and that's a big accomplishment. So I don't want to uh, undermine all the people. <laughs> marathon, people in my opinion, is anyone who's done more than half. <laughs> right. So um, the, the, how does the movement act as a trigger to the circadian um, clock? I think it, again, I don't exactly remember the multiple pathways, but the thing is back, if you think to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, they would wake up with the sun and go hunting, so they didn't spend time sitting. So that was when they needed their metabolism, their blood clotting, immune system, everything working well. Mm. So that, and but then I am not so familiar with the exact pathways and what they yeah. do in the muscle sure. mass and, you know, all those things. But yeah, that would basically be a very interesting question. I need to find out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have light, we have our food intake um, and, and what type of food we have, if we have to have it late at night. Uh, yeah. And I, I, one thing that you, was, you said about the uh, pancreas, it, it stops insulin at a certain time at night because the clock says okay this is i'm not this is not my hunter gatherer was never doing this so i'm not yeah uh, i'm not doing this um and, and i think that's that pancreas part is really interesting because that um th because when it's not secreting insulin then it's not doing the work of uh breaking down the sugars in your in your uh, food yeah. joint digest and then what happens so insulin sensitivity, that is the good thing. Insulin resistance is the bad thing where, which is related to, you know, high risk for diabetes, hypertension, dementia, fatty liver, the whole gamut of stuff, mood disorders. So insulin sensitivity, the good thing where the pancreas secretes insulin and it can manage the blood glucose levels. That is better in the first half of the day versus the second half of the day. So in the second half of the day, if we eat food, now, if we eat a higher carbohydrate food at a time of the day when insulin sensitivity is not very good, late in the evening, then the body is not able to deal with that blood glucose the same way. Now, protein and fat don't raise insulin as much. But at the same time, any amount of food would do that. And a lot of people, and it's not just in the US, it's all over the world, are insulin resistant now. I think last, uh, some paper came out two years ago. 80 to 90% of people in, this was a US study, but I'm sure it is similar in Canada or other countries as well, are not metabolically healthy. So this could be, and some of my patients, like they can't give up their carbohydrates. They want to eat that bread. I said, mm -hmm. okay, don't eat the bread in the evening, you know, <laughs> have it in the, uh, you know, either in the morning or the afternoon. And it depends if they're doing time restricted eating, they're not even, they're having breakfast late. But I said, okay, if you can't give up eating late in the night, you've gone out to with friends, then don't eat the carbs, don't eat the bread. Say no to the bread before the you know the waiter brings it in, and say no, I'm not going to have the bread. Just take it away, <laughs> and have start your meal with a high quality protein, depending on what your favorite protein is, uh, and good quality fat. Then that would. I won't say that is ideal, but, you know, we have to live a life. We can't say that, oh, I'm not going to disrupt my circadian rhythm late in the evening, so I'm not going out with my friends. <laughs> we can't live life like that. No, and I think one of, the, one of the things I thought is interesting about specifically going out and socializing, and I think it was a, story, a study on alcohol, mm -hmm. is that and it's about alcohol and aging. And I was really surprised to see how many people um, – who lived in their uh, 90s and in their hundreds drank alcohol. Mm -hmm. And the correlation um, was that they went out and drank alcohol with their friends. And yeah. we were so social creatures that the, the yeah. being out being social outweighed any of the um, poison negative effects yeah. of the alcohol. And so, uh, like you said, you, you have to live your life and be social. Yeah, it's like, okay, I mean, one thing very clear enough, we have enough studies now. Alcohol is like the safest amount of alcohol is zero. Now, that doesn't mean I love red wine. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop drinking red wine when I'm with my friends or anything like that. But this, uh, you know, it's a myth when we say that, oh, moderate amount of alcohol is fine. No, that is not true. But what you said is really true. Now, if we look at the lives of these people who, let's say, enjoy a glass of wine at five in the evening with their family, they are living very different life. 
if you look at the you know the blue zones blue zones yeah they are their environment makes them walk so much they are not sitting in cars or sitting at tables you know continuously looking at some screens but the fact is is that a life glen you and i will suddenly decide to move over to sardinia or somewhere i don't think so no but we can replicate some of those things yeah. so like you said uh, the 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 food intake um when we eat it uh, you you, yeah. you talk about um and and how we manage our light I mean, yeah. you talked about time restricted eating, T T R E. Can you say a little bit more about time restricted eating and how that <laughs> is useful? Time restricted eating is again intimately related to the circadian rhythm. So, uh, multiple studies, and I don't remember how many, but we have enough studies now to tell us that eating in restricted intervals of time versus eating throughout the day and night has a very different impact on brain function mood metabolism weight gain you know you name it all the beneficial effects now a lot of people will say we don't eat throughout the day and night so they did a study where they used an app to track you know food and drinks and as dr sachin panda who's a researcher in circadian rhythm he says our mouths are open as long as our eyes are open <laughs> so, so what his study found is people were eating for 15 hours in a day you know <laughs> The other problem is Glenn food is so easily available now. It's like yeah. two clicks on an app and we get something. Uh, earlier, you know, when I was a kid, I remember we didn't have ready-made food like that just available. You know, someone had to cook, cut, chop, you know, all of that. So easy availability on one hand is convenient, but at the same time it's also kind of getting in the way for us. So uh, Using time-restricted eating, so the minimum that studies have shown is a 12 hours of overnight fast. But if people have like diabetes or they for weight loss and they have you know problems of insulin resistance, fatty liver, a lot of people need longer fasts. But longer fast is not something I would recommend without any supervision because some people are on multiple medications; they have to be adjusted and lots of things. But Again, whenever anyone says, you know, oh, I don't know, I don't think I can ever do that. I said, just start a 12-12 is what we call it. So 12 hours is the eating window and 12 hours is the fasting window. So in the fasting window, you can drink water, non-caffeinated tea, uh, bone broth and stuff like that. So first and foremost, what is the goal for which you want to use time-restricted eating? If it is general health, 12 to 14 hours of overnight fasting is good enough for most people. 12 to 14 for hours. others, yeah, for others, they may need 16 to 18 hours. Some people may need 24 hours once a week to 24 hours thrice a week. Particularly people who have diabetes or on multiple medications, they need to lose weight, all those things. Then some people also like to do it for, you know, what is called autophagy. So basically our cellular housekeeping. Again, we don't have like a simple blood test which will tell us autophagy is happening. So again, we don't know. Some people need longer fasts for autophagy. So a lot of people do a longer fast once a year or once every you know, six months or so. So there are many different ways of using it. But most people feel the best, that the brain works the best when they, when they are not eating or drinking all the time. So, so do you, Glenn, do you use TRE? Yeah, I do. I so Dr. Sachin Panda's book, uh, the Circadian Code, yeah. I read and that really uh, jump started my interest in uh, the circadian rhythms and yeah. how it impacts everything throughout your day. And so I'm glad you mentioned uh, his his work. The um, the the fast when when I talk about you know wanting people doing fasts, they so, well, it seems difficult or I don't want to do that. I'm like, well, you already are doing it. You yeah, you already are doing it. Overnight oh. fast is like. <laughs> you're already yeah. you're sleeping, so you're not eating then. So, you know, just how do you extend it an hour or two in the evening, or maybe an hour or two in the morning? Yeah. And then you're already, then you're already at uh, 12 hours pretty, pretty easily. Yeah. But um, ideally, it's important to actually track because it's very easy to go out of the eating window. Yeah, I, and I think that's important for everything we talk about here, and we, because we talk about we're all different, we we need to experiment, but you but you have to have some way to measure the experiment. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, I think tracking, tra you know, these tools like the wearables I'm wearing, the Aura yeah. Ring here, and and I have the Apple Watch, and these tools are great. The main thing they do is bring awareness to what yeah. you're doing. Yeah. And then, and then allow you to potentially do an experiment. 
Yeah. And so yeah, I think I'm glad you you said noted, noted that because if you if you are tracking that 12 hours, you can see really easy. Oh, I did 12 hours, and that yeah. that becomes much much easier. Yeah, now, you, and you get a lot of insight from just tracking. I remember a patient said, "Oh, I'm doing 14 hours of TRE, and I'm not seeing any change, nothing." I said, "Just send your tracking information." She got the shock. She said, it's not 14 hours. It's not even 12 hours. <laughs> you know? So I don't have to try to convince somebody the data talks to them. Yeah, and, and you can see it improves your sleep then like yeah. and, as, and, and resets your master uh, clock for your circadian yeah. health, which then, like you said, has all the downstream effects uh, for everything from your metabolism to your uh, brain health and cardiovascular uh, health. And um the the brain health part of it, you know, what what does uh, the time restricted eating do for your brain health? So time restricted you now for the now what is good for the heart is good for the brain. And when I look at brain health, I look at three foundations. So number one is optimal blood glucose levels. Number two is optimal blood pressure levels, and number three is low levels of chronic inflammation. And all these three things are impacted by the circadian clock and TRE. So eating in shortened intervals of time have reduced inflammation. It has reduced blood glucose levels, and it has also reduced blood pressure levels. And some of those effects are independent of the weight loss. Some people lose weight, and weight loss is, of course, one of the best ways to reduce blood glucose and blood pressure. But maintaining weight loss, as you know, Glenn, it's not it's not an easy thing. It's very hard to maintain weight loss. We can lose weight on, on any like a cabbage soup diet or something. But maintaining that weight loss is the biggest challenge. So, yeah, TRE can help in so many different ways. So the the so we have the light for as I said for sort of like Gerber. We have the light. We have the food intake TRE. We have exercises. Is, is there another one? So the um, seasonal change is also another factor. And studies mm -hmm. have shown that our blood pressure can change depending on the season. So summer and winter. And again, a lot of things have become so difficult now to, you know, because, for example, I'm originally from India. So a tropical country, there is no change of seasons. You know, we have same length of day and night throughout the entire year versus now I'm in Alberta and Canada where Winter days are really short, so that affects mood in a very big way. And summers are like 14, 15 hours of daylight. So all those changes, how we adapt to that change of moving from, you know, a tropical country to somewhere so further north, that also has a huge impact. So there's so, so many different ways. Maybe, you know, some of us were, uh, our bodies, our ancestors were not used to this kind of traveling from, you know, one place to another. And that changed our circadian rhythm in many ways. The so the uh, first thing you know though is light, and I, and I think that's one of the things I really want to dial down or di uh, dive into a little bit more is the light, and it's not just light evening light. Um, it's no. light in the morning too, and I, which I yeah. this one was fascinating. This is the fascinating, most fascinating thing I think, and I like to talk about around uh, sleep and setting your circadian. Uh, clock is that getting a good night's sleep and having your aligned circadian clock, it starts first thing in the morning. Yes, it starts first thing in the morning, or you could even say it starts the previous day. So uh, getting daylight exposure on the eyes, and ideally it should be outside. Now, the thing is, you know, it doesn't work for everyone. Like, I may not have the option of going out into the sun when it's like minus 20 here. <laughs> And, yeah. and get daylight exposure. But how I look at it is getting daylight exposure at any time of the day is important. And I've seen it. I've noticed the difference in my sleep. So I make it a point to get some kind of daylight exposure, walk outside, even if it's for just five or 10 minutes. So that is important. Now, a lot of people think daylight exposure is vitamin D. No, very unlikely you're going to get enough vitamin D from just exposing your face. <laughs> Circadian rhythm and daylight exposure is very important. Some people say as little as two minutes of daylight exposure. Some people say half an hour. So I think it's it's not a it's not like hard it, it's not hard and fast which one works for whom. But any kind of daylight exposure is what I say. It also improves mood. You know, if you'll notice that. So we live with the sun, and I think that's that's like very important. <laughs> 
Yeah, I had to. I was I was really busy this morning getting ready so we could record today and uh, getting some other things done. And I, you know, it's super nice out here. I'm in San Francisco, and I I was like, okay, I just need to go out for a quick run. It's going to be yeah. short. It's not, it's not my half marathon uh, yeah. time on the pace, but I, I needed to go. It was just a, and I labeled labeled it in in Strava my mental health run because I just needed yeah. to get out get some yeah. light and it's it is so impactful yeah. uh, to be able to do so and these it, are i would think these are simpler start strategies than using something much more difficult for i mean yes it's not that simpler strategies are going to help everyone but i think these are things we can do ourselves easily and just to have to figure out where it fits into our day and you know how we can get do that more and the other thing you mentioned about movement. So something in the tiny habits world, we talk about, you know, movement micro breaks. So as BJ talks about, you know, the two push-ups after every time you pee. So <laughs> adding those little bit of movement micro breaks throughout the day, do some, you know, two wall pushes every time you pee or whatever, you know, just walk around every time you have a phone call. And things like, you know, walking or moving after a meal and not sitting down that has a huge impact on blood glucose levels as well. So those yeah. are simpler things to do than, you know, adding another medication. And of course, there's a place for medication. Sure. But these are simpler things to do rather than, you know, oh, I don't know what is going on. <laughs> yeah, that the and you mentioned uh, Dr. BJ Fogg, who is the um, uh, the originator of the tiny habits method. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, there's different ways to do that, but I think one of the to get to get that movement within your uh, day, there's almost an infinite number of ways to get that movement yeah. into your day. Yeah. Um, I, I thought after you after you finish your meal or after you put your last dish clean, wash your last yeah. dish as, as the at leading edge of your uh, chilling edge of your uh, previous habit uh, is to to get some movement in. And I wore yeah. a um, continuous glucose monitor for a little bit. And mm -hmm. I noticed when I went to walk, even especially if I ate something that was more carb yeah. heavy, yeah. The, the way I uh, was able to say, okay, well, I did, I did have this carb heavy meal. So let's just I have to go for a walk. And you could see yeah. how the spike was less how of a spike, yeah, it came down. Spike, yeah. more of a, a low, yeah. less of a curve. And that's just was so, uh, is so enlightening to yeah. know that. So the CGM is actually behavior changing. So Glenn, will you tell us a little bit more? Because not everyone may be familiar with the CGM. Yeah, so it's a continuous glucose monitor, and it, it works by I just I use it from a company called Levels, mm -hmm. and you know, it's just put, you pop it onto your skin and put, pierces a little bit into your yeah, skin. It's but, a little tiny, like an eyelash. <laughs> but barely, you don't even feel it. No, it, it pops in. Don't no. feel pop in, and it connects to an app on on your phone, and you can see how when you what you eat and how you get a spike in your glucose and we want to obviously have a, a limited number of spikes and more yeah. of a smooth correct to have it more smooth yeah. for, your, yeah, right. for, for yeah. your metabolic health and 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 what i that was again i didn't i don't have it wear it all the time um I, I did it for a period of time to to experiment with as an experiment yeah the experiment was was a couple of different things. Like I said, after a carb heavy meal, uh, I I saw a spike, and so the lesson was to get some movement. And yeah. when I did that experiment, I, I had less of a spike. The other thing I was doing is I, I make a morning uh, shake, and I mm. had, I was putting different things into that, and it, I was able to then look at an experiment like what was going in there that was causing spikes. So like a full banana, yeah, for me caused yeah. a, a glucose spike, whereas um, yeah. the half of the banana was less. Yeah. Yeah. A banana is like 60 spoonfuls of sugar. So, <laughs> yeah. And in a smoothie, it's like a mush. So it's even more easily, you know, assimilated. Yeah. Yeah. So so it made me uh, understand what was happening with the, the food I was yeah. eating and be able to adjust, just slight adjustments from going from a full banana to a half banana, small adjustment, yeah. but made a, a difference in how my uh, body was reacting from a metabolic level. Yeah. The CGM is really behavior changing. I mean, I recommend it to all my patients if they want to. And all of them have, like, most of them are shocked. Like, some of them think that some particular food, like your smoothie, they, they think that, oh, this is, like, really healthy and very good. And then they get the shock of their life. It's not that healthy. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, everything that went in it is healthy, and, yeah. and, but and, and not... 
all together and then yeah. the quantity that was that it was yeah um so let's talk a little bit about uh sleep and brain health i was i really wanted to understand how the the interconnection between those two and the three foundations that you have of mm -hmm. brain health so sleep is uh, extremely important, obviously, otherwise Mother Nature would not have designed our bodies such that eight hours a day we spend, we are supposed to at least spend sleeping. So uh, recent studies have found that what happens during sleep, that is the time when the brain does all the detoxification. So the, recently, uh, a few years ago, scientists found a system called the glymphatic system. This starts with G, G-L-Y-M-P-H-A-T-I-C, not the lymphatic system. So the glymphatic system works at night when the brain is relatively, it gets the rest in the sense there is no movement activity, brain is not functioning the way that, you know, throughout the day we are doing multiple things. That is when the detoxification happens, the glymphatic system is activated. Then sleep is extremely important for, you know, putting memories into long-term storage, so memory consolidation. Sleep is very important for mood regulation. So you'll notice that, you know, when people don't sleep well, like road rage and all those things, and I'm, I'm sure you've noticed it in yourself as well. When you don't sleep well, you don't feel the same, right? Uh, maybe yeah. more irritable or things like that, or your, you know, loved ones may tell you, you know, didn't you sleep well last time? <laughs> like what happened? Then, of course, sleep is the master regulator because it's uh, the part of the of circadian rhythm. So master regulator of all the different metabolic processes. Then the immune system. If you don't sleep well, now the immune system is very important for every disease on earth, whether we talk about heart disease, stroke, dementia, mood disorders, everything is related to the immune system. And the immune system doesn't function as well when we don't sleep enough. And again, I'm not going into all the nerdy details of what happens to natural killer cells and this and that. But just to know that if you want to build your immune resilience, sleeping well is extremely important. And there's the different stages of sleep yeah. have different functions. And, you know, you talked about ones that cleaning out of the yeah. plaque of your, of your brain. Um, that's more in the REM sleep. Yeah. Uh, area and then uh, others is just your recovery of your body and your non REM uh, yeah. state. When we loot, when we are not sleeping well, we're really often not getting that because we sleep in cycles and that happens yeah. multiple times. I mean, yeah. our clients report this uh, a lot uh, that they uh, they they have trouble where they're, they're they wake up in the middle of the night is one of the most common challenges, yeah. or, the, or they uh, have trouble falling asleep. Um, in either case, they're shortening that uh, those cycles down. And, and oftentimes they're missing that full REM sleep. And yeah. that, is, that is really the key part of the brain health. And yes. I don't know, if you drill down a little bit about what's happening there in the, for so the brain health. You point. brought up something very interesting. So sleep happens in these, you know, different stages, as you said, non-REM and REM. And each of these cycles are about 90 minutes long. And REM sleep, which is the rapid eye movement sleep, is where, that's why one of the ways to know whether you get good quality sleep is uh, do you dream? Now, uh, you know, I <laughs> I can see that slide in front of my eyes. But, so REM sleep, the largest amount of REM sleep happens after the five and a half hours at night, five to five and a half hours. So if someone is sleeping for only five and a half or six hours, they are taking away the largest part of the REM sleep that we get at night. And the REM sleep is, like you said, it's extremely important. Now, sleep is not just one stage and not the other. So we cannot just improve only REM sleep. All of sleep has to be improved. It's not like I'll only improve my REM sleep. I can I don't have to bother about the rest. Another important thing is with alcohol. So what alcohol does is a lot of people say that, oh, I'm going to take a nightcap because it makes me sleep better. But it completely messes up the sleep architecture. So it's like duration may be same or maybe even higher. But the sleep is not restful sleep. The arc sleep architecture is completely messed up because the REM sleep is not as good. So, yes, you're absolutely right. And five and a half hours of sleep is what the brain considers as core sleep. So if I if I if you don't get five and a half hours at night, you'll notice that you feel like taking a nap in the afternoon because your brain wants to compensate for that, you know, that missing sleep. <laughs> 
So yeah, the, all of sleep is important, not just you know one segment and. <laughs> Yeah, so that's so what's really interesting is the the last part after five yeah. and a half hours that that last bit of sleep that's that six to eight hours of sleep yeah that, that's where you're getting the biggest bang for your buck for yeah. your REM sleep where you're really getting the the cleaning out of your, your the plaque in your brain where yeah. you're getting the memory consolidation where you're really getting smarter from what you learned from the day before yeah. <laughs> to be able yeah. to apply it to the next yeah. day. Um, now you also, you said the way to t test that is dreaming. And I think that's, that's funny to, to look at because I, when you do sleep it, like the amount of time and you're, you get the best dreams right there before you're yeah. waking up and you're, and you're like, Oh, I want to go back into that dream. It was, yeah. it was so good because that, cause that's where, you, that's a good sign though. That means you were getting, yeah, that you're getting that, that, that thing. And, and if you don't get that, what's the long-term impacts on your brain? If you, if you over time continue to only get that five and a half, six hours sleep so uh, the first thing that it gets affected actually is mood and uh also there are studies which have, now, i don't want to get into the details of you know plaque and beta amyloid in dementias like alzheimer's but uh they found that shorter sleep duration people have more plaque and more uh, uh, beta amyloid but there are a lot of people who have more beta amyloid in the brain and plaques, but they don't have dementia. So it's a it's a little controversial area now whether this plaque and you know plaques and beta amyloid are actually protective. So you must have come across these studies. So that is one. The other thing is because the brain doesn't get to detoxify, so maybe it's not beta amyloid and plaque, but there are other things of detoxification. So long term effect. Again, increased risk of dementia, blood glucose going up. Diabetes is one of the biggest risks for dementia. Blood pressure going up. Now, blood pressure is one of the biggest problems in the world because a lot of people with hypertension have no idea they have hypertension because it doesn't have any symptoms. So unless they actually measure it, they don't know. So low, uh, not just, you know, less duration of sleep is also poor quality sleep. Then there are problems of sleep apnea, which are in the realm of the sleep medicine specialist. But sleep apnea is actually quite common and often ignored. You know, people make fun of, oh, this one is snoring. And then, you know, sometimes you find that the person is not breathing when they are sleeping at night. So then that needs to be tested by a sleep medicine doctor. So obstructive sleep apnea is a huge problem, higher risk for heart disease, stroke, dementia, everything. But even those who don't have obstructive sleep apnea, shorter sleep duration and poor quality sleep, both will impact all the three foundations of brain health. And another thing a lot of people don't talk about is longer sleep duration. So if someone habitually sleeps for 9 to 11 hours every night, it's not just catching up on sleep, missed sleep in the, <laughs> throughout the week, just habitually sleeps that long. Those are red flags for conditions like depression or even dementias. So that is not talked about a lot, about longer sleep duration. It's like, oh, this person's just lazy, he just keeps sleeping. No, that could be a red flag for something else. <laughs> so you mentioned in those, in, uh, in mood, mood, also decision, decision making yeah. is Im impaired. Uh, and you mentioned blood glucose is, yeah. is affected. Is this, and this is connected to, why you crave sugar if you yeah. are not getting a good, getting not a good, getting sleep, good right? sleep yeah yeah so if you want to re reduce your sugar intake yeah great way is to get good get enough sleep, sleep. <laughs> get, enough, get enough sleep no, i wouldn't say good i don't want to say good because any sleep is 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 is, is good sleep um, yeah but uh but improving your sleep and optimizing your sleep especially if you want to make better decisions uh yeah. be more productive uh, uh just be in general it's it, some people have we, we our clients report that you know there's just they might not be having insomnia or mm. having a major issue but just have low level stress and anxiety yeah. and that's often connected to these not getting that through all, all those sleep cycles especially yeah. that last uh, sleep cycle is, is that is in your is that in your experience too yeah and another important thing is sometimes people don't assign enough time to get the seven hours seven or uh, eight hours it's like they are in bed for seven hours. Now, all seven hours, hardly anyone is sleeping. Like if someone hits the bed and falls asleep right away, less than 15 minutes, then that means are they very sleep deprived? And if they don't assign that time, you know, they have to wake up at, let us say, six in the morning and go for a run. 
and they haven't uh, had enough time to get that sleep, that is also something that people don't usually realize that they're not assigned enough time to sleep. Yeah, so simply something simple uh, as planning enough time yeah. to be yeah. in bed yeah. uh, is a key tool to yeah. to be able to improve your sleep. And I think that's a great great place to just start. Is yeah. just to, do, you, do you have t- enough time? Do you in have bed? give yourself enough time to sleep? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so just I want to go back to the circle back to the alcohol uh, mm-hmm. piece. And that's impact because you talk about uh, the fact that it, you, you will get in the morning some, uh, you, you'll want to have a nap in the next day. That's a, that's mm-hmm. a sure sign of, of, of an impact from the alcohol. You're not getting, you're not getting the last, you're not getting the stages, the long yeah. REM stages. So you're not getting the impact of being able to take what you learn from the day and being able mm-hmm. to apply it. What are some of the what are some of the other areas that that it impacts? Short sleep duration again impacts like all the impacts are negative. I mean yeah. the list is really long. You start from the immune system, you start from blood glucose, inflammation, mood disorders, high risk for dementia, high risk for heart disease, poor digestion. Sometimes a lot of people have IBS. They don't realize that the IBS is because either they have they are eating very late in the evening which is impacting their sleep so late evening eating and sleep impact both of them are adding to what they think is a gut problem which is you know why how can that be related to anything to do with the brain but the gut and the brain are intimately related so it i mean poor sleep just in duration as well as quality uh, has no good effects at all <laughs> other than maybe giving an extra hour for someone to work i don't know but I think most people are not productive when they haven't slept well. In the so, if you wanted to have alcohol, it's best to have it uh, several hours. Best to before. have it earlier in the evening. But again, like I said, you know, it has to be. It has to match with your life. The other thing is, you know, if someone is drinking late in the evening, most important is to have some protein before just the alcohol, and not a whole lot of carbohydrates because alcohol cannot be stored in the body. So alcohol has to be processed right away. And if along with the alcohol, people have a lot of carbohydrates, then what happens is the body decides, I have to process the alcohol right away because it's a poison. I can't store it. Then I'll look after the carbohydrates later. So by that Mm. time, blood glucose levels have already gone up. Right, right. Uh, So let's let's talk one more thing. One one other topic I want to talk about before we're done here is around so we talk about shift workers and yeah. world health organization has said shift working is a carcinogen. So yeah. it, it, it's, you know, leads to all cause mortality. Yeah. And, but you know, some people have to do uh, have to shift. Do work. Yeah. yeah. So, we're, you know, hopefully they don't have to do it for too long in their lives and they, they can take, like you said, some of them, yeah. uh, other things that they could do around exercise and uh, how they manage light and um, eating to help with that. But, we're, the people that are, are that are not shift workers, they don't traditionally think of themselves as shift workers. The one thing I, I really took from Dr. Panda's book was that we're all we're all pretty much uh, shift workers in some yep. way because of, because of the way we work now in a twenty four seven, always now uh, global world. Yeah. That we whether we're working with like you said colleagues at um, different time zones. Or uh, or just digitally on online with TikTok or WhatsApp or something yeah. uh, or Instagram something later. Um, what what would you uh, what would you assign? To, what would you tell people the to understand better how they can impact their shift working, um, so, even though they don't they might not think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So one is of course the shift worker, and you already said what they could do if they can change their jobs. Fantastic, but. Uh, the World Health Organization calling shift work is a potential carcinogen. And I think this study had shown shift working for many, many years. It wasn't just like one or two years of shift working. I don't remember exactly how many years, but it was quite a long time. So if someone has a shift working job, they should not think that it's just like in two two years of shift working is going to change that. But yes, in the ideal world, uh, you would follow your body's clock. The next thing is what you're talking about is our social jet lag, you know, that we have artificially created that. First and foremost, I think it's important to find out 
what is it that makes someone stay awake at night is it work is it you know scrolling on social media is it some work related things if it is scrolling on social media is it possible that you could have you know you have more than one phone you have two phones one phone is your regular phone and the other phone is your the one for emergency so that anyone your family or anyone needs to get hold of you after a certain time that number is there with only a few people and you switch off your other phone and keep it somewhere where you don't see it because you know i'm sure glen you've noticed it if the phone is right next to us it's very hard not to pick it up <laughs> yeah <laughs> and once we pick it up even i have noticed that with myself even if i don't have any notifications turned on so even if i don't see those red little this and that i will still go and click on you know whether it's whatsapp or email or something so the best is not to have the phone anywhere nearby if that is a problem that is not a problem for everyone and the other thing is not to have the phone right next to our head so that first thing in the morning wake up and you know pick up the phone and that's so why that, the, yeah sorry, sorry? as i was say why in the morning is that that you don't want to have that phone first thing so you want to start your day in a rather calm fashion and sometimes our phones are like it can also be a distraction sometimes people keep scrolling on their phones and they've missed out that in time which they had actually set aside for exercise <laughs> or it's like something contentious starts the day and you want to start your day in a much more calmer way and again it's different things like some people their work is such they can't help it they have to look at the phone in the morning <laughs> you know? right uh the 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 social social jet lag that you call it is um is is would you since the world health organization said that over over time that shift work is a potential uh yeah. carcinogen would you say that social jet lag is also heading in the same be um, in the same direction? i would say not just for cancer it is i mean it's poor metabolism higher risk for heart disease stroke and dementia we have more dementia now than we have before one is of course people are living longer but overall the metabolic health of even younger people is not as good as it was let us say 50 years ago and sleep is one of the factors it is also the poor quality food that is easily available and the environmental toxins the climate change it's not one factor but it's multiple factors which are impacting everyone so how i look at it is what are the things i can control i can control my sleep and to a great extent i can control what i eat and when i eat uh but environmental toxins i can control my toxic exposure but i cannot control everything in the environment like i can't con- control uh, you know atmospheric changes or i can control the pesticides and the gazillions of you know um hormone disrupting chemicals that are there in the groundwater but i can at least control my use of plastic so i don't use any plastics at all for food and i can control my use of plastic bottles so i don't drink out of plastic bottles i can control my use of skin care products skin care is one of the biggest problems of you know with hormone disrupting chemicals which many of them disrupt our metabolism home hmm. cleaning products another big area so there are i look at okay this is what i can control i cannot control what is outside my you know uh, in the atmosphere so we need to look at each and every area of our life and figure out what what it means so if someone if there's a prof- if you're a professional and you're just starting out on your journey for circadian health and brain health associated brain health what advice would you have for someone who's just getting started uh first of all like i said you know can you go to bed and wake up at the same time every day regardless of weekend or weekdays and the next is find out you know is it your food what are you eating are you eating enough protein a lot of people don't eat enough protein and particularly a lot of people who are working out their protein requirement is more so if we don't get enough protein what happens is our muscles are not built and proteins are made up of amino acids and some amino acids are considered to be essential amino acids meaning a body doesn't have the ability to make them so uh getting enough protein getting good quality f- uh, fat will automatically sort of reduce our carbohydrate intake if we start a meal with protein first you know then you'll find that i'm sure you've seen it if you start off with a steak or something like that 
you you can't eat a lot right after that you want you finish one steak and isn't much you know, you know you don't have the desire for something more but if you eat like a pizza or burgers or something it's very easy to eat more than that so food is the next thing i would look at the next the third thing is movement uh, is the person sitting continuously because like we discussed a lot of our work nowadays are uh, involves continuous sitting daylight exposure so how can we incorporate micro breaks of you know movement micro breaks and another area which we didn't talk about is stress so what is stress doing to us now stress is not always impairing us there can be you know stress that can be debilitating there can be stress that can be enhancing our performance and this is very interesting research when i read about this i thought oh this is exciting so how we look at stress now yeah, okay. you know glen you talked about someone who's just starting let us say it's a it's a person who's just started a new company that stress is very different that is like challenge stress versus threat stress and that is in a way that's like good stress in the sense that i'm excited about building my new company doing a whole lot of new things but what is the stress impacting how is the stress impacting my behavior because some people have poor coping mechanisms like you know using smoking or drinking or you know eating poor quality food as coping mechanisms because it's like i'm stressed so i'm justified in doing these things so our coping mechanisms are things we can control so all of stress is not bad it's not like you are stressed so you are de- destined to die early and your brain cells are going to get eaten up it's not always that <clears throat> yeah it's, it's a stress is enhancing mindset or a stress is debilitating mindset yeah. it can be just a mindset uh, just a mindset to- and as simple as watching some videos i mean i'm sure you you read that paper dr elia crumbs where they had a group of people looking at these short videos of stress is debilitating versus a group which looked at videos showing stress is enhancing your performance just watching the videos made a huge difference to their cortisol levels and a whole lot of things well that's fantastic i think it's a great uh, place for us to wrap up yeah. dr kadnam if someone wants to reach out to you and uh, learn more what's a, what's the best way for them to connect with you So the best way is uh I have a website drcarmd.com and I think you're going to share that the link to my uh so I have this um, ebook which you can download um you can give your email id for that and it's 20 myths about optimal brain health of course there are a whole lot more than 20 myths <laughs> but that's <laughs> another way to so the that website is guide g u i d e dot drcarmd.com And um, it's been lovely talking to you, Glenn. Yes, lovely talking to you as well. Thank you, Dr. Shabnam, and for taking some time for being on the show. Thank you, Glenn. And thank you to everyone for listening. Until next time, be well. Hey, thanks for tuning into the show. Any information about this week's guests can be found in the show notes, along with other resources for upgrading your own performance and enhancing your well-being. Lastly, if you want to join the Stamina Lab community, head on over to staminalab.io. Until next time, be well. Thank you.